like to lift your hands and thank Him that He bestowed that amazing grace upon us. Without measure, Father, we can come to You. Your grace is not just sufficient, but it's more than sufficient. Hallelujah. Thank You, Jesus. Blessed be Your name tonight. I give You glory. I thank You for Your presence. Thank You for Your mercy and Your grace. Thank You, Jesus. Oh, thank the Lord. The psalmist said, The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. I have a goodly reward. Brothers and sisters, we have a goodly reward. It is of more value than anything in this world. And I'm so grateful that I found Jesus. He is the answer. Thank you, Lord. I'm so thankful that His Spirit fills us. Not just to quicken us. I just read that, I believe, today or yesterday. The same Spirit that filled, that, that filled Jesus and quickened His mortal body is going to quicken our mortal bodies and I'm so thankful for that aspect of it. But it gives us power to walk above the filth and the, uh, the pressures, the temptation, all the things of this world, the carnality of this world. I'm so grateful for the Spirit of God. You know, it was put in us. Not just so that we could go to heaven, but so that we could live and be fruitful and multiply here and while he's left us on the earth. And so I want to encourage you, Pastor, talking to us about being fruitful. That's our purpose. Our purpose is to be fruitful. It's not just to get the Holy Ghost, check all the boxes every day. Yes, I prayed. Yes, I read my Bible. Yes, I'm doing all the right stuff. No, it's to make an impact in our world. It's to be salt and light. He said if the salt has lost its savor... Brothers and sisters, we're salt. If we've lost our savor, if we're not flavoring our world, then he said it's good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. So it's not just about receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, but it's about walking pleasing before the Lord, fulfilling our calling and our purpose, and that is to be fruitful. And one way that we can do that is by encouraging one another, strengthening one another. The Old Testament mentions that iron sharpeneth iron, so a man the countenance of his friends. And I believe that God's calling us to do that in the last days. The book of Acts Church, the Bible says they continued daily in the temple with one accord, breaking bread from house to house. They did fellowship and, and God added to the church daily. It's so important that we spend, not just do church together, but do life together. Last night I had an awesome time with some men that have been mentoring and working with over the past year. And we met last night and just had a wonderful time. In fact, one of the men texted today and he said, that was the best session that we've had yet. And uh, I'm so thankful that it doesn't get old. I told him last night, I said, I don't want this to be a drudgery, just another thing that we have to do. I want you to leave here feeling blessed, encouraged. I want brothers to sharpen the iron of brethren. And I believe that's what God's calling us to do. I'm excited. Our ladies have a a group going. I believe they meet here on the first Monday of every month for prayer. And then Sister Tanya and Sister Amy Tysinger, I believe, are heading up a, a, a book reading group. I would encourage you, get together with people and do it with a spiritual purpose. Not just to get together and talk about the latest events and sports and whatever is you have in common. That's all well and good and you should do that. But we need to come together and bring something of value. Build up one another. The scripture talks about edifying the body of Christ. That's what we're called to do. So I encourage you, do that. Don't just think about it. Put a plan to action. If you're married, talk to your spouse. Honey, when can we do this? Sundays is a perfect opportunity to do that. With one service, we ought to be fellowshipping the body of Christ, strengthening, and not just those that you're closest to. You're already going to spend time with them. Reach out to those that, that you maybe don't have a great relationship with and start building a greater relationship because the stronger the foundation is, the higher the Lord can build the church, the kingdom. And people coming in need to be need to be just integrated into the body of Christ and we need to be intentional about that amen let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight just ask him to bring our hearts and minds together let the word of God the spirit of God minister to us tonight Wednesday night if we're not careful can be just another one of those boxes that we check but I pray that you've come tonight expecting a word from the Lord the scripture says seek and you shall find 
knock. You're not just going to stumble upon some, earth, some heavenly treasure. It's going to be because we're seeking, asking God for it, searching for it. So I, I encourage you tonight as the word's going forth, say, Lord, what do you have in this for me? What can you put in me that I can share with somebody in my path tomorrow? Father, we're so grateful to be in your house tonight. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for, Lord, your grace in, in, in allowing us to grow up and to be mature in your body. I pray, God, that you would help us to continue to grow, not to stymie or stagnate, but, Lord, to continue to be fruitful, that we wouldn't be cut off, but, Lord, we would continue to bear fruit, more fruit and much fruit, that you may be glorified. I pray that the Spirit would have its way in this place tonight. Quicken our hearts and minds, Lord, that this wouldn't just be an exercise of knowledge or hearing the Word, but, Lord, it would find good ground in our hearts. Lord, that it would quicken us and make us alive. Help us to feel the burden of the Lord, God, to see the work of the Lord that you've placed in our hands. Give us each a word tonight, Lord, that we may leave this place and use it for your kingdom. We ask it in your wonderful name. And everyone said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We're going to invite the ushers to come tonight. Wait on us for our tithe and offering. As they come, just a couple of announcements. Um, in the coming weeks, you're going to see some slides added to our announcements uh, about faith promise. Uh, we've, as a pastoral staff, designated the first Sunday of the month is going to be Faith Promise Sunday. And um, it's just going to be a Sunday that's dedicated to sharing some information about, uh, about the mission field and reminding you of your commitment to the kingdom. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to bring your offering on that Sunday. Whatever works for you is fine. But it's just going to be a, a Sunday that's designated toward that. So there will be a slide that uh, will also remind us a week in advance that Faith Promise is coming and uh, so excited about that looking forward to Memorial Day is coming up just around the corner our annual Memorial Day picnic I'd encourage you to invite your neighbors invite your friends reach out uh, to brothers and sisters in the body that maybe aren't as connected people that may not be here every Sunday every Wednesday every Saturday uh, connect with some people invite them and uh, be that bridge that would draw them in to a great time of fellowship and uh, so we're looking forward to that. Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness. Thank you for your spirit, your blessings upon our life. Thank you, Lord, that you blessed us in such a way that we have to give back to your kingdom. I pray that you'd receive our offering as we give it with thanksgiving. We'll give you glory and honor your wonderful name. Amen.
of you. Thank you that we know that you're inside of us, Lord. You're not just a God on the outside that we call on, but you're a God on the inside that strengthens us. You walk in us, Lord. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. You know, we're probably about half strength here tonight. And if you've ever spoken, done any public speaking, it's kind of nice to have a, a, a tighter group, if I can say it that way. And so I'm, I've talked to pastor about this. I'm like, it's just, it looks so thin when you look out on a Wednesday night because we're spread between two separate campuses. And uh, so uh, after you fellowship tonight, if you're sitting behind where Sister Carol Kramer is there in the bright green jacket, uh, if you just grab your stuff and move up in front uh, and let's fill this front part up. Our children are going to be dismissed to their classes, so that's going to free up some more seating in here. And so, uh, children, you can go ahead and be dismissed. Let's fellowship with one another. And if you'd grab your gear and move forward, we'd appreciate that. Lord bless you.
Tonight, we're continuing on in a series of lessons entitled Doing God's Work. I thought Brother Lashley was going to just teach my lesson while he was up there. And the reason why we want to do God's work is because we want to please him. I just want to make God smile. I just want him to look down and go, that's my kid. But we can't come up with our own plan to please God. It just doesn't work that way. It's kind of like buying your husband what you want for his birthday. It just doesn't work very well. And so it works so much better when we get our information. We get what he wants. So what we want to find out what God wants to make him smile. So let's all pray and ask the Lord to help us to glean understanding and wisdom and to have an open heart to receive and to be engaged tonight, to engage our minds and to think as we're, as we're planning, as we're listening here, rather than, like Brother Lashley said, sometimes it can just be, you know, something we go through the motions of. But if we can be thinking, how can I grow in that area? How, what, what is it that God wants me to grow in? If we can pray that way tonight, I think that would be pleasing to God. God, you're so good. Thank you for your word, for it is instruction and righteousness. I appreciate the word of God. I appreciate, oh Lord, that you love us enough to give us your word, to preserve your word, that we could become more pleasing in your sight by knowing your word, that we would bear fruit, and Lord, that our minds tonight would be engaged in your word, and that you would speak to us individually, and that we would receive your word and allow it to change us, for the power of the word is transforming, and I ask you, let that transforming power be known in work in us tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. Our text tonight comes from Paul as he's speaking to the church of Thessalonica, and it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's kind of a lengthy reading, 1 through 12. And he says, Furthermore, we be- then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For ye know that the commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go before and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified." For God hath not called us to uncleanliness, but unto holiness, who hath also given us his Holy Spirit. Brother Lashley talked about that. That's the reason why we possess the Holy Ghost, because it enables us. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Brother Lashley taught on that again, spoke on that. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia, But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. What is he talking about increasing more and more in your love for the brethren, love for people? That you be studied to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That you may walk honestly toward them that are without. That's without, outside of the church. That you may have lack of nothing. Again, the apostle Paul is admonishing The church, that's you and I, the church on how to please God. No matter how long we have walked this road and this had a relationship with God, none of us have arrived. None of us have arrived. In the first verse of our text, Paul says, we teach you this so that you would abound more and more. We haven't arrived. We can abound more and more. God is infinite. We never stop growing in him. And the more we grow in him, the more pleased he is with us. I want to please God more this year than I did last year. I don't want to just please God by myself either because I believe it's pleasing to God that we please him by helping someone else grow along with us. And Brother Lashley spoke about that as well. Fellowship. And that's why those of us who have have walked this road have been raised up on these pews and who have a great knowledge and have a foundation of the word. Those of us who have walked with God for a while ought to be mentoring someone 
who is not as far along as you. Maybe they've been here for a while, but they aren't as far along as you are. We need to be mentoring. You know, Brother Lashley was talking about he has a group of young men who he mentors. That's not just Brother Lashley's mentor, men, ministry. That's for each of us. We're to pick, pick up somebody and carry them along with us. Just all you got to do is find one person that's one step behind you. One step. They don't have to be a brand new convert. One step behind you and lead them on to where you are. We ought to be mentoring those that are young in Christ. They shouldn't have to learn everything by trial and error. But those of us who've been there and done that and have the scars to prove it, we can see the traps that the enemy has set before them. We can see the things that they're going to be stumbling. Oh, this is going to happen. I, I experienced this in my walk. And we could share wisdom and we could share experiences that we had and successes that we had along the way as we lead and encourage them and pick them up if and when and when they fall because they will fall because none of us got up and walked off perfectly. So if and when they fall, we pick them up and we reassure them of the love of God, the unfailing love of God, that you got this, you can make it, God is with you, I am for you, I got your back. And you know what? They're going to get stronger as they keep getting up. Every time they fall and they get back up, they get stronger because they're holding his hand. They, they have a determination. They didn't just lay there. As they let you speak into their life, they're getting stronger. It's an investment. It's an investment that we're making, but it's an eternal investment. An eternal investment. You know, I, I put away into my 401k. Many of us do. We probably, we all should. Put into a 401k or some kind of retirement plan. That's an investment, you know. But, and, and hopefully the Lord comes and I never have to experience that. But eternal investment? You don't lose on an eternal investment. You don't lose on that. It's an investment. However, the benefits never come without some sort of cost. It's going to cost you something. It costs me something to put away in my 401k. I don't get to spend it today because I'm saving up for when I retire, right? Are you seasoned saints? Are those of you who have walked in this for maybe a year or more, are you willing to let it cost you something? Are you willing to let it cost you? Because eternal value is cheap at whatever cost of energy, money, time that you put into it. I'm telling you, it's, you, got, you got a good deal when you get eternal value. When you see them make it, when you see them starting to walk on their own and not needing to hold your hand anymore, when you see them take the training wheels off and say, hey, there's somebody I can mentor. When you see that, when you see your handprint upon somebody's life, there is a reward there, earthly reward, that is so inspiring and so encouraging. But think about the rejoicing that we're going to do when we get to heaven and we see all those that we have fingerprinted in heaven and that they have fingerprinted in heaven. That is going to be jewels to your crown. Think about that. It's amazing to see the positive results when one submits to the process of mentorship. Think about that. Who can we mentor? Who could I mentor? Now, they're not going to be perfect, but they're going to grow much faster if we will carry them along, if we'll give them some wisdom than if they were left to themselves, right? Right? They have better odds if we'll mentor them. We must nurture those around us. That's the way that that's the reason why the church is called the mother of us all. If you're a part of the church, then you're a part of the mother. We nurture our young. We carry them along. We we encourage them. We grow them. And if we want to live to really please him, that's what we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to get outside of what really pleases me, to what really pleases Him. Oh, I want to be useful to God. I want to be used in the gifts of the Spirit. I want to be more than just somebody who comes and sits on a pew and has an experience with God, and then okay, I'm done. I'll pay my tithe and offering, and I'll do all the do's and the don'ts. I want to be useful to God. I want to be filled with the Spirit and be able to have the Spirit work through me in the gifts of the Spirit. 
then we must be willing to submit to his process if that's what we want. We must be willing to submit to his process, just like those who we mentor submit to the process of mentoring and not be afraid of what it's going to do to us if I submit to the process of God, but trusting for what it will do for us if we'll submit to that process. As we contemplate this topic of living a life that's pleasing unto God, we also have the understanding that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we look to the scriptures. How can I live pleasing to God? How can I live pleasing to God? And there's this word in the New Testament that just keeps jumping out every time I want to be pleasing to God. And it gives me some direction. It's called sanctification. Sanctification. You know, nearly 30, uh, it appears 30 times in the New Testament alone. That's just sanctification or sanctify. That's not including holiness, which is very similar. The basic idea, number one in your notes, the basic idea or definition of the word sanctify or sanctification is set apart. Set apart. This is first to be set apart unto God. Set apart unto God means that I'm set apart from this world and its mindset and its philosophies and its theories and its cultural acceptances. Pastor said it many times, sanctification begins at new birth, but it is continues on until we make it to heaven. Our process of sanctification never ends until we hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, it says, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This verse is describing the instantaneous set apart unto God when we receive the spirit of God. When we are born again with that new experience, there's an instantaneous setting apart of believers unto God. That's that moment of regeneration. When we're baptized in his name, when we've repented, when we receive the Holy Ghost, we are sanctified, set apart unto God to live a holy life. Well, there's the other part of it. And that, when we do that, that's pleasing to God. This is not a once saved, always saved message. That's just the beginning experience. That's just the moment of regeneration, of reborn, your new chance. But the process of sanctification occurs progressively. Some, for some, it's, it goes along a little faster than others. Some people are a little slower, a little slower bloomers. I was a slow bloomer. I can't make fun of those people. As we daily seek for a greater conformity to the character of Christ, this process of, of sanctification grows in us. And Paul says, that's what Paul meant when he said, we beseech you and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us how you ought to walk to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Continue growing. It doesn't stop. Why do we need to abound more and more? Because it's not natural for us to walk in the spirit. And we all default to a carnal man. Without the power of the Holy Ghost at work in our lives, we de default to the carnal man. And so we have to more and more be sanctified and learning to walk where, oh, I don't fall in that spot anymore. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Paul says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And here's the, the hope that we have. And such were some of you. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You got a brand new lease on life. You are justified by the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. See, we all came to God with baggage. Every single one of us came to God with baggage. I don't care if you were born and raised on these pews. You came to God with baggage. We all have a past. And although believers are set apart unto God, 
When we're born again, we must continually bring our daily practices and our daily living, practical daily living into conformity to the experience of regeneration. Yes, I had a moment where I received the power of the Holy Ghost, but I don't always let the Holy Ghost control me. So I have to take my my practical side of living and say, no, you will conform to the Holy Spirit that is within you and to please him. When we look back over our life, there should be evidence that we have grown in sanctification. From the moment of regeneration, there is, should be evidence that I have grown in sanctification. Old things are passed away, Paul said. Old habits don't entice me anymore. Old mindsets don't trip me up anymore. Old verbiage and conversations that I used to have don't fill my mouth anymore. Old desires don't tempt me anymore. Because I've grown, I've abounded more and more in this process of sanctification. We're called to live in a way that pleases God and there should be evidence that we're walking in that calling. It's not just a come down here and receive the Holy Ghost and then I can do what I want to do. As long as I go to church. But I should be growing. I should be growing in that pleasing of God. From our text 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul instructs us as to what pleases God. And these are not merely Paul's opinion. If you'll notice, his his exhortations are in the Lord Jesus. He repeats that multiple times. In verse 1, he said, we exhort you by the Lord Jesus. In verse 2, he says, for you know the commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. These commandments addressed practical matters. Very practical. Want to see how practical? They they addressed sexual ethics, fraud, mutual love, work ethic, honesty. These are practical daily living. The word instructs us what to do to live a life pleasing to God. But you know what? The spirit of God within us is what enables us to do that. I may know what to do, but if I don't let the spirit have its way in me, I don't want to do that. I may know this is not right, but if I override the spirit of God that is within me, then I'm not going to live pleasing to him. Have you ever wondered, what's the will of God for my life? I imagine we've all wondered that at some time or another. And though God has a specific and unique purpose for each of us individually, there are some characteristics of God's will that are common to us all. He has called all of his people unto sanctification and holiness. He has called us to holiness and sanctification. Forty-two times in the scripture we find the command, be holy. Forty-two times. You'd think that was pretty important. In the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, he said, I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. In the New Testament, Ephesians 1 and 4, he said, He hath chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Number two in your notes, it's God's will that we grow in practical sanctification and holiness we got to grow in this. We haven't arrived. No matter where you are in your relationship with God, you can't sit back on your ease and go, okay, I've done it. I'm here. There's growth. There's room for growth until you get to heaven. And he made this possible for us to continue to grow because he gave us the ability to control our bodies through the power of the Holy Spirit. When he gave me the Holy Ghost, he said, now I have empowered you to do not what you want, to say, not my will, but thine be done. That's when he gave us the power. But do we use that power? See, I can have gas in my tank all day long, but if I don't turn the key and go somewhere, I'm not using that power, right? You can have the Holy Ghost in you, have experienced the regeneration process or or, or experience but not let that process work in you, and it just does you no good. From our text, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 12, Paul points out it's always the will of God 
to avoid sexual immorality, to avoid fraud, to be an honest person, to love others, to live quietly, to mind our own business, to work to support ourselves. With a broad paintbrush, that's the will of God concerning all of us. So if you're ever wondering what the will of God is, right there you have it. Right there you have it. Can you do all of those things consistently? Woo! That's, that's a little one that we could, oh, if anytime you start asking, go back to that scripture and go, do I do all of these consistently? Then we could start worrying about, because if we do all of those consistently, guess what? We're in line with the spirit and he'll lead you where his will is. You won't have to wonder where, what's his will? Let me, let me remind you, our text, Paul is writing to the church, to you and I, and does it surprise you? That the first aspect of sanctification that Paul speaks to the church about is abstinence from sexual sin. The church. He wasn't talking to rank sinners. He was talking to the church. See, we're not the first generation or culture to experience complete void of moral conscience. Where the philosophies of the world seeped into the church. And the people of the church began to think, oh, everybody's doing it. It's okay. That's just an old way of thinking. See, we're not that first generation. In the first century, sexual promiscuity of all kinds was accepted and expected. Due to the Greek culture that had permeated the world, who had taken over, the Romans had had, had militarily conquered the world, but the Greeks... They were the philosophy of the day, and their philosophy was immoral. And so that's the mindset that these new converts of the first century church brought in with them. It was socially acceptable. There was nothing wrong with it. Everyone was doing it. It was the norm of their society. Does that sound like today or what? So Paul has to address this matter, and he instructs these new believers in their need to conform to a much higher sexual ethic than which they were accustomed to or which they had been raised to believe was true. See, we tend to think that our culture has progressed beyond any other. I, I do. Like, oh, my Lord, we have, we have just gone too far. My mom says, I don't belong here anymore. <laughs> But here Paul is in the first century with a culture much like ours. Much like ours. Sex was so casual that it meant nothing. It had nothing to do with the commitment of love. So we have to be careful, brothers and sisters, not to let the norm of society creep into our thought process of what's normal or okay or accepted. Number three in your notes, regardless of what is culturally acceptable, holiness calls us to, for controlling our body in sanctification and honor. God's calling is higher than that of this world. Just because this world says it's okay, just because this world says it's normal does not mean it's normal. Just because it's accepted to them does not mean it's acceptable to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 through 20, he says, Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Once you've received that regeneration process, don't you know he dwells in you? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body for two? Saith he shall become one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The unchanging word of God that is forever settled gives very clear direction to be setting apart from this world's notion and opinions about sexual freedom. And to be set apart unto godliness. Godliness. Even in our sexual behavior. Especially in our sexual behavior. 
In the very beginning of creation, God demonstrated and established sexual ethics. First, he created male and female. He created them male and female. Genesis 2, 2 and 20, 2, 24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The second way that God established sexual ethics was he ordained that sex be taken place within the covenant of marriage. From our text, 1 Thessalonians verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 6 the next item that Paul deals with in the church, he says, don't defraud, deceive, swindle, cheat, con, take advantage of your brother in any matter. In any matter. Now, a lot of commentaries say that that's referring also to sexual sin. Adams Clark's commentary says to corrupt a wife. Of an, the wife of another, or to alienate her affections. With all that being said, to please God by living a holy life involves more than just abstinence from sexual impurities. From our text, verses 9 through 12, Paul catalogs several items that should be characteristic of a believer's life. He lists them as honesty, living quietly, minding one's own business, and working to support ourselves. In verse 12, the progressive nature of sanctification is seen again, calling believers to increase more and more. Again, he says, he started in verse 1, abound more and more. And he says in verse 12, increase in these things more and more. And these, I, these, these themes of how to please God appear throughout Paul's letters. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he exhorts us to pray for those that are in government. And then he points out the reason why. Why should you pray for those that are in government? They're doing things that I don't necessarily agree with. I don't like their governmental. I don't like their, their stance. Why should I pray for them? He points out why. He says that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Am I a Christian? Honesty is I am always who I say I am. Do I love them? Then I should pray for them. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, he wrote, this, command, this we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all but are busybodies. Now them which are such we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. And to the church in Ephesians he wrote, let him that still, who stole, steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his own hands the things which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Christianity, Christ-likeness, is a practical faith. It's not all in the worship. It's not all in the crying, in the repenting. It's in the living. It's in the living. He has called us to live for him. Live holy life. It's in the living. It's a practical faith that transforms our behavior and our lifestyle into what pleases him. Number four in your notes Practical theology demonstrated in lifestyle issues confirms our faith. That's the first thing it does. And becomes a witness to those around us. We say we live for God. Here's the confirming of our faith. We say, I've been reborn. I've been born again and I live for Jesus. Do I? Do I do these things that please him? Do I seek to please him or do I seek to please myself? Does it confirm my faith? Practical theology. That's the putting it to our, our belief system, to our practical daily living. It confirms my faith and it becomes a witness to those around me. It makes me a light set apart from the darkness of this amoral society that we are surrounded by. And I've found that when I am pleasing him, then I am the most fulfilled. 
I am the most complete. I am the most joyful. When I am pleasing him, I love my life. See, pleasing God truly does please us. God, Jesus himself gave us one indicator of how people would know that we are living to please Jesus. He gave us one indicator of how the world will know that I live to please Jesus. Jesus said in John 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Little Ashley spoke on it a bit. And when Paul comes along, he reiterates this to the church when he's saying these are the things that please God. He says, in, in verse number nine, he says, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write to you. For ye yourselves were taught of God. Jesus said, this is how people are going to know. To love one another. See, without godly love, there is no sure evidence that I'm living to make him smile. There's no sure evidence Three chapters in 1 Corinthians are consumed with instructions on the use of spiritual gifts. Ah, I want our church to be healthy in the spiritual gifts, in the gifts of the Spirit. I pray for that often. But of these three chapters, one entire chapter is given to the exaltation of love as the supreme virtue. And it concludes with these words. And now abides faith, all that I am. He says, I can be all these great things, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. And now abides faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these. Oh, come on. Don't you think that faith is the most important thing? Come on, brothers and sisters, don't you think we're apostolic Pentecostal? Don't you think faith is the most important thing? Jesus says, no. If you don't have love, it doesn't matter. Faith works by love. <laughs> so you don't really even have faith if you don't have love. And there's no evidence that I'm pleasing him if I don't show that love. Brother Lashley's been preaching on this. I don't need to preach on it. Brother Lashley's been preaching recently that love isn't just, this love he's talking about, it's not just a feeling. It's not just that warm, fuzzy feeling I get when I look at you. It's something that we can't even truly do if we don't know him. This world doesn't know how to love. Did you know that? If they don't know Jesus, then they don't know love. So that's whenever they get around you and they start feeling that. They're like, whoa, what is that? I really love that. Oh, yeah, you do, because that's real love. That's love. We can't even truly love if we don't know God because God is love. See, godly love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us, suffers long. That does not feel like a warm fuzzy to me. It's kind. It envieth not. It vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave itself unseemingly. It seeks not its own. It's not easily provoked. Oh, you do, do you? <laughs> that one got me. Thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. I still believe in you. I know you fail, but you get back up because I still believe in you. I got the love of God in my heart, and I want to show that to you. It hopes all things. I got great hopes for you. God's got purpose for you, and I hope to see that. I hope to be a part of that. It endures all things because they'll drive you nuts. Those mentees that you mentor, those young people that you pray for, those kids that you love, those new converts, they'll drive you crazy. But it endures all things because that's the love of God in us. It's not that warm, fuzzy feeling. It's inconvenient. The love of God is not convenient, brothers and sisters. That's a tall order that we cannot do without him, without the spirit of God giving me strength because I'm done. 
I'm done. You, I, you've just pushed my last button and I'm done. The Spirit of God says, well, I'm not done. I'm not done. And it bears all things. It believes all. It endures all things. It never fails. It never fails. That's a tall order, brothers and sisters. And since love is not merely a feeling, it must be demonstrated. Love that isn't demonstrated is unrealized. You know the saying, perception is reality. My perception is my reality. Their perception is their reality. So if those who we come in contact with do not perceive the love of God working through us, then to them it doesn't exist in us. Huh. That's a tall order. Think about that for a minute. And then let me propose to you, there's no better way to show the love of God than to invest yourself in someone else. That's that mentorship. That's that mentoring saying, come on, I was there. I used to, do, I used to fall in that same spot. But you know what? God gave me grace. God will give you grace. If you're not mentoring at least one person, pray earnestly. I ask you, I implore you, pray earnestly to God to give you direction. Who can I mentor? Who can I bring? Who's one step behind me, God? And you don't have to be a seasoned Christian to get somebody who's not quite as far along as you. It's the will of God that his people grow his kingdom. That's what Pastor was saying, to, Brother Lashley was saying tonight. We have to multiply. We have to be fruitful. How are we going to do that? It's not just the experience. It's that process. See, that experience thing, that's really the easy part. Coming down here, repenting of our sins, getting baptized in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost, that's really the easy part. You know where the hard part comes? It's that work, that process of sanctification. That's where they need you. Oh, you can shout around here and spit and worship and jump and all the things until they get the Holy Ghost. But can you pick them up and say, come on, brother, you could do this. I know it's rough. I know it's tough. I know you've, you're feeling lonely. You've left all your worldly friends. I know you're bored because you don't do all the things that you come over to my house. Spend some time with me. <laughs> See, that's the work. And that pleases God. That's building up his kingdom, and that pleases God. A well-lived Christian life is a powerful, persuasive influence on those who observe it. A well-lived Christian life is a powerful, persuasive influence. Who are you influencing? Who are you influencing? Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, in the era of Pentecost, this life that pleases God includes not only these characters and qualities that distinguish people of faith. You know, we're honest. We don't cheat people. We're, we're moral. We don't, we're not immoral people. We, we work we don't drag on society. We're productive. So it does more than just those things. But it also includes a realm of the supernatural experiences. Introduced first when they receive that regeneration process, when they receive that outpouring of the Holy Ghost. That's why I pray often that the church be healthy in the demonstration of the Spirit demonstration of the gifts of the spirit we have something more to offer them than just a good lifestyle a good clean lifestyle see back in the day well, i don't know maybe the 30s they they had pretty good clean lifestyles everybody did people who didn't even go to church but or at least the majority of people i should say but we have more to offer them than just living a good clean lifestyle we have the Holy Ghost. And not just the experience of the Holy Ghost, but the power of the Holy Ghost working through us in the gifts of the Spirit. That should be something that operates naturally in the body of Christ. Not just in the pulpit. Not just in the pastoral staff. But in the body of Christ because we possess the Holy Ghost. It should be operating in us. We should have a word of wisdom. We should have a word of prophecy. We should have a word of knowledge. 
We should have that. That should reside in us. Brother Billy Cole was on a missions trip or was in, on a missionary trip to Thailand, and he wrote about this experience that he had there. He said, we really didn't have a lot of persecution, but there was some in that new little church. There was a woman that faithfully attended with her children every Sunday, and her husband was very angry with us, and he didn't want his family involved with us. And one Sunday, they slipped off to church while he was asleep. Later, during the service, the man came into the church with an ax, intending to kill our pastor there, and all the saints began to cry out to the Lord, and the pastor, he was a very gentle man, and he simply stood behind the podium and cried, Jesus, Jesus. The attacker swung the ax two or three times at the pastor, and every time he missed. He'd hit the pulpit, or he'd hit something around him and damage it, and the Lord answered their prayers, and suddenly he struck down the attacker. And he fell on the floor and began hemorrhaging and bleeding. And the man was taken to the hospital. But later, he was converted, and he was baptized, and he received the Holy Ghost. Why? Because we have something more to offer. We have the power of the Holy Ghost at work. That's the power of God working on the behalf of them that please him. Number five in your notes, genuine obedient faith which is an eternal, internal matter, results in the transformation of one's life both internally and externally. See, again, none of us have arrived. Unless you can say, I think, act, and speak with the mind of Christ at all times, then we have not arrived. And I pray that during this lesson, each of us have examined ourselves. For areas where, we, where I can grow, where I need to further grow in the conformity of the image of Christ. They were singing it tonight. His, uh, let, yeah, let his image be or formed in me. Be formed in, let Christ be formed in me. Whoo, couldn't get that one out. Let Christ be formed in me. That's where we can grow. I don't care how long you've been doing this unless you look just like Jesus Christ. Unless you talk like him, unless you act like him, unless you walk like him, then you got room to grow. We got room to grow, brothers and sisters. Let's not be comfortable and stymied, but let's grow. And let's don't just grow alone. Let's pick somebody up who's just one step behind us and grow them with us. Whether those areas that you know, know in your life that you need to grow in are external so that other people can see them or they're internal and only you and God know, I need to grow right here. I, I implore you, begin to pray daily. That God help you be committed. Help us to be committed to continually growing in him, abounding more and more in the conformity of his image, the conformity of Christ's image. Stand with me and let's pray and ask the Lord to seal this word in us. Help us to be more like him. He created us in the very beginning in his likeness and his image. It was sin who, who changed that. I don't want that to keep me from being more like him. God, you are a great God. And your love, oh God, is unfailing. And your word instructs us in righteousness. And I appreciate, Lord, the correction of your word. I ask you, Lord, to... to Impress on our hearts the areas that you want us to grow in. And God, give us wisdom to know who we can lead and mentor in growth. That your kingdom would prosper. That your kingdom would be built up on a strong foundation of truth and sanctification and holiness. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Bless my brothers and sisters and keep them as they go home. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.